founder of CLC and ULS Punjab University Chandigarh. Invite you to a session which is more like an interactive session. It's not the normal way, way where we have been holding the webinars. Today, uh, we are pleased to announce that we have amongst us three honorable judges and two from the Delhi High Court and one from Bombay High Court. Uh, honorable Mr. Justice Rajiv Sahai and Law Shah, uh, Justice Rajiv Sahai and Law, then Honorable Mr. Justice Vibhu Bhakru and Honorable Mr. Justice Tama Shishaydri Naidu. And those who have been following up these webinars, they know that Honorable Mr. Justice Dama Shishaydri Naidu has already given us the insights on two different aspects, that is uh, common law principles and precedents and advocacy, tools and skills. And Justice Rajiv Sahai and Law not only has given various insights on different platforms, and be that as it may, while as a judge, if one goes to his court, as well as on in, before the court of Justice Bhikkhu Bhakru, there are insights which one learns, but there are certain issues which crop up normally in the mind of a lawyer. What is the procedure to be followed? The entire procedure, the entire advocacy, whether the procedural law is a master or a servant, what are the changes, what are the challenges? So on behalf of John Law CLC and ULS Punjab University Chandigarh, when we approached them, uh, it was decided commonly that these are the issues which are required, especially given during these testing times. And since it was realized that there are certain questions which ordinarily the students, the professors, the, law, the lawyers are invariably have, are having within their minds, but they do not get the right direction in that regard. So amongst us, as I said, we have three speakers giving their perspective in a different way. We will not be take, I'm not taking much time of introduction because I, I would have, uh, I would be very candid enough on that point that since there are three speakers giving different insights and there are large number of questions which are likely to be cropped up. So we are giving, we are around having 30 minutes of the interact, uh, the introduction and then uh, we will have the question answer which can be posted in the chat box. I will ask Honorable Mr. Justice Rajiv Sahai and Law to take over the entire and sir, I, I think Justice Bakru has joined and probably has not joined by the name. I can unmute everyone and thereafter we will mute everyone uh, everyone, and we will again unmute Justice Rajiv Sahe and Law. Justice. Would you just... Uh, Say then we uh, we can see that what by what name you have entered. This is Bakru. Uh, I think my screen yes, is showing DHC. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That is what we were trying to see. We will change the uh, name. So over to Justice Rajiv uh, Sahai and Law to give his insights and there are. then Justice Vibhu Bhakru and then Justice uh, Tamashi Shadri Naidu. So that the insights what are given by them, we are able to hear it. Otherwise, there is an audibility problem. Uh, good evening, everyone. Good evening, Justice Bhakru. Good evening, Justice Shishadri. Good evening, brother. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Chatrad, I think when we discuss the topic, uh, I understood it as a, a procedure relating to civil matters, but I don't think it has reflected in the title which has been chosen. In any case, uh, uh, I am uh, competent to speak only on the procedure regarding civil matters. I'm not even competent. I don't claim to be competent to speak about uh, procedure uh, relating to criminal matters. So. 
what I intend to uh, place before everybody is, uh, and particularly in civil matters about uh, civil suits. Now, let me take back, uh, take all of you back to late 70s, early 80s, when uh, I had joined the law faculty. Now the professor, the good professor who was teaching us CPC, in the very first semester, in the very first class, he committed the mistake of telling us, all of you must have heard that oft-repeated sentence, that procedure is the handmaiden of justice. And I think he couldn't have done a bigger mistake. Most of us stopped attending classes, or even when we were attending, we are not paying much attention because we thought that, oh, this is like um, something which is not relevant and the emphasis had to be on the substantive law. So while we were very active in the substantive law classes, putting questions to the teachers, at least in our batch, none of us paid much attention to the CPC class. And uh, I'm sure that some generations before us and several generations after us, this trend must have continued. And then when I entered the courts, in the very first few days, I learned the phrase in the interest of justice. So whenever the judge said, you haven't done this, you haven't done this, you are not in compliance with this provision of CPC or any other procedural law, the easiest sentence was, my lord, in the interest of justice. Now, this continued for a very long time. And again, I'm saying that I'm qualifying that maybe uh, it may continue in other civil jurisdictions because civil jurisdictions are not only civil suits, but civil repetitions, labor disputes. They may cover land reforms. So in all those uh, family court, there it may still be good. But what has happened over the years, I'm telling the history from 1982 uh, till say about 1999, 2002. This sentence that uh, procedure is the handmaiden of justice and the excessive jurisdiction which the Indian courts are known to exercise. Uh, I think all of us, uh, must be aware that the statistics show that the exercise of jurisdiction by the courts in India is more than the exercise of jurisdiction in the exercise of discretion in any other jurisdiction. So every judge was molding the procedure in spite of the existence of CPC as per his or her sense of justice. And that had the natural consequence which was bound to follow that the procedure, the handmaiden, became instead of uh, for the advancement of justice, it started eroding justice. See, I'm talking of that era when I myself as a counsel for the defendant, we have taken three to four years to file the written statement where the interest of the client should and so. There were umpteen number of applications for amendment. A lot of times, full pleadings were not made intentionally with the full knowledge that amendment later on will be allowed and will take at least two, three years. Uh, so, sir, I'm sorry to bother you. Uh, could you just come slightly forward, though I, it's audible for me, but people are writing on the chat box that they are not. All right, yeah. So, uh, this, uh, there were delays not only in completion of pleadings, there were delays even in uh, 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 testing amendments, additional evidence. So at each and every stage, and to give you an example of uh, the field in which I practiced most, uh, the landlord and tenant, a bona fide requirement case would take 15 to 20 years to decide, and by which time the original cause of action had disappeared in the 15 to 20 years, the entire circumstance of the family changes. So it really became a killer of substantive justice instead of advancement of justice. And uh, let me at this stage digress and say that after all, why 
procedure was brought about in law. See, it is not as if uh, before the courts, the formal courts were constituted. There were no justice delivery system. There was a justice delivery system earlier also. The only difference was it was not guided by procedure. As the number of disputes grew, and uh, there were more and more cases being brought earlier before the king who used to render justice, then to his nominees who were rendering justice. They started feeling the need for a formal procedure for dispensing justice so that there was some amount of certainty of how one is to proceed about it. And it was meant to expedite the rendering of justice, not intended to delay. So not only did the exercise of discretion and violating the procedure for the sake of substantial justice, not only did it erode justice, it caused delays which was only also counterproductive. So we saw the backlash which happened in 2002. It started with 1999 when the amendments to the CPC, some amendments were brought and finally more amendments. So restrictions were put on the time for completion of pleadings, on amendments, on additional evidence. All these provisions were intended to be taken away. Now, that again didn't serve the purpose because you know that sentence was so strong though it was coined way back in 1900s by some law professor and I quoted from him by Justice Krishna here and the Indian context but that and, and you'll be surprised to know that he has said it in the context of a criminal matter but it kind of pervaded all systems of uh, justice delivery it was transported to civil law also where uh, ideally one should have been guided by procedure. So when 2002 amendment came, the courts were so used to handmaiden of justice that they again said that no, these provisions are directory, not mandatory. Now, ultimately that has resulted in what uh, you have seen uh, as the Commercial Courts Act in 2015. And uh, what a large number of high courts have made rules. Now, those rules have taken away the discretion. They have started forfeiting the rights if they are not exercised in accordance with the procedure. So to that extent, there has been a change. And uh, today, the procedure in certain parts of a civil trial is uh, no longer in the hand of the judge. If you don't comply with the procedure, you forfeit your right and you have to suffer adverse consequences. There is no discretion up to the Supreme Court stage, only which may in the exercise of its uh, powers may, 141 powers may say that, all right, we ought to like this, notwithstanding there being no fault. So today, if uh, since the topic has been posed like a question, the answer would be, it is uh, no longer a servant for a large section of the, I would say, crucial section of a civil trial. But it is a mistress, and so it is a master. But for some sections, it still remains a servant. But my caution would be that uh, everybody has to be very, very cautious in exercising and using it as a handmaiden of justice in the areas of CPC, or the procedure where discretion is still given. Because if we continue to exercise discretion in a very wide way to uh, overlook the violations of procedure, ultimately that power also will go because the legislature will come and they will take away that power. Now, if you look at it from another point of view, I'll just take a couple of more minutes, that what is the difference? Why, what is the importance of procedure? What is the difference between uh, a, a litigant and a lawyer? A litigant knows the facts of his case and the logic behind his claim to being right better than any lawyer he can engage. But why we still have the legal profession is because the litigant does not know the procedure. It is very important for the lawyer to know his procedure as well as to know his substantive law because otherwise, if the lawyer doesn't know his procedure, the whole 
reason for his presence in a court or during the trial would be defeated and the judges might as well listen to the litigant now having this mind you i would also like to place before you a perspective from the youngsters it's very interesting so i thought i'll share with you i have two youngsters in the family who are also in the field of law so when i asked them the answer of one of them of course was nearly about the same that uh, it is uh, it depends upon the situation or the facts that uh, what will happen but the other answer was very interesting the other answer was it depends upon who the judge is so <laughs> having said everything i think uh, 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 a large part of it also varies from judge to judge there are some judges who are going to exercise that discretion some who are not going to exercise that discretion so from the lawyer's point of view it is important to know uh, the law saying that it is a mistress to defeat violations of the opponent and from the judge's point of view also it is very important to know that use it as a, uh, a mistress to control the excessive time or the malafide game being played by one of the two litigants in the litigation thank you uh, Sir, we will call upon uh, Honorable Mr. Justice uh, Ravu Bakru to give the insights. Then, uh, just uh, Damashi Shatru, right. so that uh, we have already posted on the, we have already announced that few questions can be taken up. Since primarily, as you have rightly said, that as to whether it's a master or a servant is the issue, and as to whether what is the discretion. All these insights, especially the lawyers, would definitely like to know. Because this is an art and nuances which one learns with the flux of time, and especially once you learn it from the persons who are on the other side, and they are giving the insights how to go about it. Uh, I request Honorable Mr. Justice Vibhu Bakru. Thank you. Well, I it is the pleasure hearing Justice Rajiv. Uh, he rightly pointed out that this expression that procedure is a handmaiden of justice and not a mistress has been repeated so often. And it is uh, right from probably his college days. And but if you look at the decisions that are rendered by the courts, it, it I mean the earliest that I could find was in 60s from uh, from the Supreme Court. But uh, obviously this is paraphrasing of a phrase that is about over a century old. But I think that when you look at a phrase like this. And the momentum that it has gained over periods of time, because it's repeated and repeated again, then we lose sight of the context in which this phrase actually was coined in. So it may be a little profitable to look at some of the quotes uh, of some decisions. So one of the things that uh, one of the quotes that I could uh, I would like to. Uh, mention it is which which had put this same proposition it's somewhere in 2005. This was a case of Kailash versus Nanku, and here the Supreme Court said that all the rules of procedure are handmade of justice. Good stuff. The language employed by draftsmen of processual law may be liberal or stringent, but the fact remains that the object of prescribing the procedure is to advance the cause of justice. In an adversarial system, no party should ordinarily be denied the opportunity. Of participating in the process of justice dispensation unless compelled by express and specific language of the statute. The provisions of the CPC or any other procedural enactment ought not to be construed in a manner which would leave the court helpless to meet the extraordinary situations in the ends of justice. So therefore, if you if, if one just understands the nuances of this, first and foremost is that it should serve the ends of justice. In other words, your procedure must not constrain you to an extent that you can't dispense justice. So when you look at the problem that which are now which is now arisen, that is the endemic delays in docket this explosion that happens because delay in itself is a cause for people to file. Why would you not file and get an interim order and take it for 20 years with, with really no fear of losing even if you lose uh, and take advantage of the time that is that, that, that litigation in this country takes? 
the the resultant the the resultant uh, the results that comes out is that the ends of justice do get defeated so therefore whether the procedure is is really is to be taken as sacrosanct in certain cases or whether it should be uh, it should it can be departed from is all depends on whether what what really is the ends of justice and how it would be how it would be served uh, different different courts over the period of time have expounded this this proposition in different uh, words but let's see the ramifications of this i think the first and foremost uh, implication of this is is felt when the laws are prospective or retrospective so clearly when a procedure procedural law is amended and it is amended to address a, a, a particular situation that is there is the general principle that the law is not is not retrospective and there is a vested right that is accrued to a litigant to follow a particular procedure is not accepted so the general rule then props up is that if there is a change in law regarding procedure because it's a handmade in of justice and it's really handmade of justice uh, of justice and because it's really to subserve justice then they, it really does not give any vested right in any litigant to say no please follow the procedure that was in existence prior to a statutory amendment so this is one of the areas where this uh, this plays out and and uh, i think this was uh, placed much earlier in uh, about about a century early earlier where they said that uh, no person has a vested right in the course of procedure he has only the right to prosecution or defense in the manner for, for the time being by or for the court in the case which is pending so this principle which was about almost a century old now plays out in in this aspect just uh, another another curious uh, thing while justice uh, ran naidu uh, and low is uh, addressing and giving a speech i had a quick look at indiacanoon.com on the most recent judgments where handmaiden of justice has been repeated and you will be surprised that there are nine supreme court judgments that have followed that have mentioned this phrase either in their language or quoted uh, picked up a quote from another judgment you have uh, a case here is uh, the 1st of march 2019 i'm only taking here where is um, a case of varun pawan versus renu choudhury here a, a person did not implead a particular party so the member of parties one uh, he moved an application for amending the member of parties at the fag end after really the arguments had been heard and supreme court the high court in allowed but the supreme court said the rules of procedure are handmade of justice and cannot defeat substantive rights of the parties and it is obvious in the plain that he would have meant to include this particular party and therefore this amendment was allowed you have another case which is a recent one of the most recent case in arbitration national agriculture versus uh, nafed versus elementa where justice uh, arun mishra he of course was brought with considering a question whether an arbit whether a person was an arbitrator can in an appellate proceedings act as a counsel there again this principle was trotted then uh, there is a the, the in uh, this was in april, as recent as 22nd april 2020 then on 19th march 2020 that is 3 days ago in a, a the supreme court while considering whether uh, additional material could be examined in the, in the context of disqualification of mr sharad yadav from uh, the legislative assembly on the account of pension schedule again said well you can bring additional evidence the high court had rejected placing additional evidence on the ground that disqualification must be viewed from the perspective of the date when he was disqualified but again the supreme court said handmade procedure is handmade of justice same phrase again repeated and then uh, that application the decision of the high court was set aside and and uh, the additional evidence was allowed to be uh, produced 
Then you have indoor development, which we all know. This came in 6 March 19, 2020. Again, this passage has been used. Then you have New India Assurance Company. This was done in, this is on 4th March 2020. So we are only in April and March as yet. And this again, this phrase is used in, uh, in this case, this is in context of the Consumer Protection Act. Then you have uh, uh, Pioneer Urban Land and another versus Union of India. This is on 9th August 2019. This is in the challenge of the IBC amendments to include real estate allottees as uh, financial creditors instead of operational creditors. Here again, they have said that procedure is a handmaid of justice. So even, even real persons who have lotties of flats can be considered in IBC proceedings as financial creditors. You have uh, another case of Hebreddi and uh, Yalapa Hosmani. This is on 9th May 2019. This is on abatement uh, by, of a particular suit, while another suit, cross suit, was pending. Here again, uh, the court uh, invoked the same principle. Uh, you have uh, on 7th May 2019, a case called State uh, by Inspector of Police versus Subramaniam. This is on the context where the, it is in criminal law where a, uh, uh, an inspector did not produce his authorization, yet continued. He's a CBI inspector and yet continued to prosecute. And by the time the matter came, the, he the court held that since you have, you have no authorization, we won't allow you to lead evidence on that now. But the Supreme Court said, no, this is just, again, procedural, and therefore, procedure would uh, be applicable. Then, uh, it's, it's just the uh, same phrase used again. This phrase is again used in uh, J.K. Jute Mill Mazdoor. This is on 30th April 2019. Whether This is again in the context of IBC on the question whether a trade union is an operational creditor. They said, well, there could be members of the unions who could be operational creditors, so why not allow the trade union also to be an operational creditor? Again, the same principle is used. And you have, on 9th April 2019, Food Corporation of India versus Rimjim. Uh, that is, this was a recruitment, uh, a case relating to recruitment. A person had applied to Food Corporation for being, for being appointed. She did not put her proof of diploma, which was required in the advertisement. Advertisement required her to produce a proof of diploma. She had a diploma, but she didn't, she didn't file it. And she didn't put it in an application. The, court, the, courts, the high court said, well, she's forgotten to do so. So please overlook and allow that because ultimately it's only a matter of procedure that she should have done so. Uh, the Supreme Court upheld that decision. And again, use the same phrase of having made investment. So I do not, these are just, this is not, this is only Supreme Court and this is only in the last uh, 12 months. So one hasn't, one has to, one hasn't gone very far behind. And this is not to mention how many high courts would have used the same phrase uh, again. So literally this phrase has got a momentum that is now really unstoppable. And wherever the courts do need that they they should be, they're required to do, uh, to act in a particular manner. This is a principle that really comes to the aid. And this is procedure across boards. It is in criminal law as well as in civil law. These cases span both. So it's not just civil proceedings. Now, much of this is, this, this words actually are attributed to Justice uh, Krishna that he, he, he picked it up, but uh, picked it up from another case. So the, the case in reference uh, was actually the other way. He had put a caution by saying, in, in that particular case, was a case where because of the inability of the state government to, to challenge a decree where compensation was, it was a land, land acquisition matter, compensation was award, awarded to a person whose lands had been taken away. In, he got some 75 rupees compensation. He applied for enhancement, which became 200. The government applied for a review before the additional district judges was in, in, at the stage of reference. And that review was allowed and that decision to grant 75 rupees was actually, the 200 rupees was set aside and put as 75. Against it, the landowner went, uh, came to the high court. The, uh, so did the cross appeal got filed by the, by the state. 
However, the state did not challenge the order where, whereby it was initially made it at 200. It only challenged the order where it was reduced from 200 to 75. They wanted further reduction. In that, the High Court said that the review which was filed by the state government was not maintainable. If the review before the ADJ was not maintainable, then that decision of the ADJ to reduce it from rupees 200 to 75 was not uh, should not have been passed. If that decision went, then the compensation was 200 rupees. Now the question arose before the Supreme Court was that could the could, could the state still assail that compensation of award of compensation of 200? Well, the Supreme Court said no because that original decision, which which the state proceeded on the basis that merged with the review petition uh, or a review order, was not challenged. So the Supreme Court said that we do, we do not, uh, uh, because the state has not challenged it, although it may have ground to seek re reduction of the compensation, uh, because they have not challenged it, they have missed the bus and we will not allow it. So this was an, actually a reverse case where they said, where they said, yes, it should have been, compensation should have been reduced. The additional district judge was wrong in awarding a higher compensation, yet they denied the state government's claim uh, assertion on the ground that they missed the bus and therefore this is not, although this uh, phrase does it, uh, is, is, uh, has been, uh, Justice Krishna here had coined uh, the, the, this, uh, this law in his usual felicity of language that he enjoyed, that he, that he commanded, but it was on the reverse, but it, it was on the reverse proposition. In this context, uh, Justice Krishna here gave a concurring opinion. And I'll, I'll, I'd like to read his concurring opinion, one passage from his concurring opinion. And this is what he said. The processual law so dominates in certain systems as to overpass substantive rights and substantive justice. The humanist rule that procedure should be the handmaid, not the mistress of legal justice, compels consideration of vesting a residuary power in judge, judges to act ex debito justice where tragic sequel otherwise would be wholly inequitable. In the present case, almost every step a reasonable litigant could take was taken by the state to challenge the extraordinary increase in the rate of compensation awarded by the civil court. And by hindsight, one finds that the very success in the review application at the appellate stage has proved a disaster to the party. Maybe the government might have successfully attacked the increase awarded in appeal, producing additional evidence there, but maybe it's have no place in the merciless consequence of vital procedural flaws. Parliament, I hope, will consider the wisdom of making the judge the ultimate guardian of justice by a comprehensive, though guardedly worded, provision where the hindrance to the rightful relief relates to infirmities, even serious, sounding in procedural law. Justice is the goal of jurisprudence, processual as well as much as substantive. While this appeal has has to be allowed for reasons set out impeccably by my learned brother. I must sound a pessimistic note that it is too puritical for a legal system to sacrifice the end product of equity and good conscience at the altar of processual consciousness. And it is not too radical to overt breakdown of obvious justice by bending sharply, if need be. The prescriptions of procedure, the wages of procedural sin should never be the death of rights. They're very powerful words. And therefore, but, but the context in which they were said was that we must, if there is a procedure prescribed, it must be followed. Now this, all this said about this particular principle of handmade justice. There is, an, a, there is a country, a, a somewhat a country principle that is also trotted with equal ferocity. <laughs> and this is again an age old principle for, comes from Nazir Ahmed, 1936, Privy Council, which says, if things are, if the statute prescribes the manner in which things should be done, then it must be done in that manner or not at all. This is quite, if you, if you look at it, quite the opposing by saying, uh, quite the opposite by saying, that procedure is the handmaid of justice, because then it, it, it says if the statute, whether it's procedure or substantive, prescribes a man, manner of doing it, particular thing, uh, which would obviously actually be more procedural. Uh, then you can't do it in any other manner, but as prescribed. And this has been, this principle has been applied also. 
I, I would imagine equal number of times as uh, the oft repeated expression, which is that the procedure is a handmaid of justice. Uh, this is uh, one of the most recent judgments that this principle was done was in, in the context of whether the High Court could direct uh, registration of an FIR and investigation in case of an in case of a particular complainant who had not exhausted his alternative remedies. So even in case where alternate, the court said even in case where you have an alternate remedy of proceedings under uh, 156.3 of the CRPC, you have to first exhaust that procedure, but you cannot take the recourse to, uh, to 20, Article 226. Uh, following an earlier decision in Sakari Vasu, but they mentioned again the same principle of Nazir M. But Ahmed versus Emperor in its decision. So this is now the the other side of the coin where uh, you may have you may have substantially followed a reasonable procedure, but then it may be thwarted on the ground that it was not done in the manner in which it's supposed to be done. So really, where does the land lie? What 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 exactly should be? How should you consider a procedure law? Should you consider it as sacrosanct, or should you? consider it as something that you can do away with. And I think the answer really lies not really looking at these two oft repeated propositions because none of the these two propositions hold true in almost all circumstances, although they they have a momentum and a uh, and which 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 like I said is really <laughs> proper definition. I think the answer really is to look at the provision and answer and ask the question is it mandatory or is it direct? In, in suits, in commercial suits now, obviously the timelines are have to be real. In proceedings such as civil rights, really there is, everything is available <coughs> to a court. It, you, can, you can at any given point of time after you've concluded hearing still ask the, uh, the parties to, on any question to address it because the jurisdiction is totally different. It is a very proactive jurisdiction. Therefore I would, I would be hard pressed to imagine that in a jurisdiction like 226, you can non suit a litigant by saying you have not followed the procedure or you have not, you have not, you have not filed your petition in a particular manner. Um, as you know, Justice Bhagwati had accepted letters, postal letters as writ petitions uh, without any, any sense of formality at all. So that's another jurisdiction. You have other jurisdictions like arbitral. Proceedings. Now, arbitral proceedings before an arbitrator, there is no procedure really applies. It is evolved by either the rules of institution or by the arbitrator. When arbitration proceedings come to court, that is, uh, court proceedings arising to arbitration, then again there is a there is a very strict restraint that the courts have been put to because the statute says that you can't interfere except in limited circumstances, and there again the procedure you may have a little play, play but. Uh, the timelines, the uh, manner, uh, the grounds on which uh, uh, a litigant can approach are very, very, very strict. So that's a different jurisdiction. So really, this this must be viewed in in which which procedure regarding which jurisdiction. Are you are, uh, if if you are if you are if you address is it is it the requirement of the jurisdiction that that there should be flexibility? Then obviously, procedural rules can be bended. To the convenience of this uh, uh, of the problem. This is as far as the jurisdiction is concerned. The problem with the procedural, the another way to address is, is to really look at it whether a particular rule is mandatory or not. And I think this is apart from uh, uh, first and foremost uh, uh, question that must be answered to address this is. What was the intention of the legislature? So the wording of the statute become quite important. The language of the section becomes quite important. Then you have to see whether there are any consequences are prescribed. If there's a penal consequences for not following a particular uh, process, then surely that must be considered as mandatory. What is the what is the mischief that it seeks to address? What is the purpose of that legislation? It must uh, it must be examined, and then one can find whether the procedure is to be given an all must be considered as uh, stricter sensor or, 
uh, or whether you can depart from the same and substantially compliant should be accepted. Well, these are the, this is the principles that I, I think uh, need to be looked into and therefore <coughs> really following these adages handmade of and maiden of justice or things must be done in a particular manner or not at all are just broad principles that guide thoughts. How those thoughts have to be really, really translated in a as depends on the facts of the situation, depends on the procedure that you are looking into. Um, I, I recollect often uh, a, a judgment of the full bench of the Punjab and Arana High Court in Punjab Finance Corporation. An interesting case, it was an income tax case where the assessee had not filed uh, an audit report along with his return, which was necessary for him to get uh, an exemption. Uh, so the court then looked in the provision and said, yes, uh, uh, the, the law that the division bench of the Punjab and Arana High Court had held that uh, that would be fatal to the assessee's claim. But the, but the full bench held well, it has two components. Not conducting an audit would be fatal to the SSE scheme, but not filing the report again would not be. So, so therefore, uh, they bought in the same section, both mandatory and uh, and directory principles. Another case that come is 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 well known is about the usual requirement in civil um, in uh, service law <laughs> to form uh, an employee regarding his grading and if his grades uh, within a particular period. Now within a particular period one can digress from but the requirement that you must inform him for making a representation is mandatory. So both the both procedure may have different aspects and some of them may be you may be considered non-derogable while the others can be derogable. I think that's that would be a correct view to answer this uh, approach this issue whether it's a master or a servant. In some cases it will definitely be a master and in some cases, it will definitely be a surprise. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, sir. The insights, uh, as you said, rightly said that Justice Krishna Iyer's judgment, we all remember that the judgment of uh, Lee Chandra and these the judgments as to when it is to be used as a, to deny a claim or whether it can be not, a, uh, the claim can be more, the claim can be molded in terms of the prayer. The Dolly Chandra's judgment is very relevant and the another issue which you have rightly pinpointed that in certain cases it has the issue is always decided that justice must not only be done but it must be seen to be done and in that eventuality by molding the relief to any other writ order or direction or any other prayer the relief is always molded the judgments which you have given with, though it looks like a bird eye view but it shows the amount of effort one puts in before actually addressing. It is the same way which a lesson to be well taken by the professionals that as to a, as and when they have to go for any particular submissions to be made, though during the course of this entire session, we will also go as to what should be the style of submissions and the drafting, etc. Uh, we Amongst us, we have just as Namashri Shedri and I do. We, uh, we will take the question and answers, but before that, we will ask uh, Honorable Mr. Justice da, Namashi Shedri Naidu to give his insights on this particular aspect. Thank you, Brother Justice Sahai and Brother Justice Bakru. As Vikas has said in his prefatory statement, that have appeared already one too many times, even for the comfort of the members that have been viewing across the spectrum, but I can't help it because Vikas pleads, persists, and eventually prevails on me. And I couldn't say no. So you may have to endure me for a short while before we'll go for the question and answer session. Friends, for our benefit, the honorable judges who have spoken until now have already well articulated the procedural parameters of judicial adjudication. They have indeed underlined and highlighted its importance without, of course, overemphasizing on its role in justice dispensation as it were. I'm afraid whatever I say now will inevitably echo what has already been said. 
that I am tasked to speak a few words on the topic. But the distinguished speakers have already done that though. You may all recollect that in 1980s, a prime minister of this country was assassinated. Then there was a trial. Of course, it was in the context of a criminal trial. Then BBC was extensively covering this incident and the judicial progress of the case. Mock Tally was the correspondent. Tally now settled in India. He was born in India and for many decades carried on the reporting news from India. Every time he would say about the trial aspect, he would say, the prime minister of that country was assassinated in broad daylight, but as the Indian system is known for its notoriety for the delays, the trial has been going on for many, many years. There's a constant refrain in BBC by mock tally that I believe underlines the very purpose of procedural law in of expediting perhaps become an impediment. We all agree about the taxonomy of law or its division classification, whatever name you call that. Law is either substantive or adjectable or procedural. Isn't it too obvious to be stressed that substantive law deals with the rights and the procedural law with the remedies? That is, the substantive law is the source of our rights and the procedural law is the means to realize those rights. Some call the procedural law the law of actions because it governs or determines the process of litigation. It's the vehicle of justice, let me put it that way. With an analogy, justice is like a perishable product. The litigant is the consumer. The courts are the transporters of that justice. They always try to transport this perishable justice to the litigant consumer as early as possible and as fresh as possible. So how fast the courts deliver the justice depends on the swiftness of the vehicle of transport. That is the procedural law. But you find wheels within wheels. That's the problem. Over time, the courts have devised and developed various procedural regimes or mechanisms. And the court's aim was, and has always been, twofold. To be fair and to be fast. But the courts became conscious that one cannot be at the expense of the other. So an element of caution was introduced. Down the line, that pebble of caution on the path of justice has become an obstructive mountain almost. What's wrong and what's right is a matter of substantive law. What we need to prove that right or wrong is a matter of procedural law. In a sense, if we go by summon any jurisprudence, it says what lies outside the court is substantive law. What lies inside the court is procedural law. Every branch, as you know, of knowledge has exceptions. The law is a branch of knowledge, and it has more exceptions than one could expect or for anybody's comfort. So whatever I've said has its own limitations. For example, the entire Evidence Act is not procedural. It's partly procedural and partly substantive. Please remember, there's no watertight compartmentalization or division between what is substantive and what is procedural. If you are practiced or still practicing in any trial court, you file an application for whatever relief you wanted to as a matter of an interlocutory stage, and the registry will put under what provision and we always have the firm belief that to have any particular application for any sort of relief to be maintained, 
there ought to be some sort of a legislative imprimatur or sort of a judicial sanction by a president. But if I could quote one very good, though short judgment from Supreme Court, that is Rajendra Prasad Gupta versus Prakash Chandra Mishra. That was in 2011. Then it's been said very aptly, I reckon, that if you wanted to have a substantive right, perhaps it needs a statutory conferment. But when it comes to procedure, so long as there's no bar, it doesn't require any provision at all. And today we'll be dealing with, as you have already come to know, essentially the civil procedure. And you have seen the Chief Justice M. C. Chagla of our High Court, Bombay High Court, has once said, what a piece of legislation is CPC. The more you read, the more you feel like knowing about it. And I need not repeat, as my learned brothers have just told about, the catchphrases about the maiden of justice, uh, beginning from Vivian Bose and taking from English jurisprudence. It's become almost an aphorism. So I need not repeat. Friends, I believe that we'd better spend more time on uh, elucidating the topic by way of the questions, and then whatever the doubts that may arise could be elucidated. So I believe it's all to us who could be taking care of things. Thank you. Uh, the a point well hammered that, that the justice cannot be in a watertight compartment compartmentalization, you have to consider the entire facts, issues, what is discretionary and what is mandatory. Uh, meanwhile, the questions are being uh, coming on the chat, this chat box also, but I have also a few questions on the WhatsApp since on the invite we had posted that the questions could be posted. Uh, what are the worst practices which have developed in contemporary times as regarding prosecuting a civil claim in court and what should be done by the advocates to avoid the same? So, uh, just to the in-law show, I will just unmute the in-law show. Yes, sir. Uh, see, uh, uh, our counsel who is interested in delaying the matter or who feels that uh, it is for the benefit of his client to delay, uh, will use the uh, every uh, rule in the CPC to delay. Now, what the criteria which uh, I can speak from my experience, what uh, uh, I have been uh, applying is that uh, if one feels on the very first day that an application which has been filed or a reply to an application which has been filed is uh, just for the purposes of delaying, then the attempt is to uh, nix it in the bud. But uh, uh, coming to your question that what are the worst practices, I've already said before uh, the 2002 amendment, it was at each and every stage to delay the filing of the written statement or the replication as the case may be. Thereafter, to not file documents, take obtain adjournments for that. Then for framing of issues, there was a time when the, the cases used to remain pending for uh, a couple of years for framing of issues. Then uh, okay. amendment of the issues. So uh, you can uh, use everything after that discovery, even when the discovery would not have served any purpose. So uh, you open the CPC and you start filing one application after other till you have reached rule uh, 24, 25. And in the meanwhile, death used to take place, then substitution, not substituting all the years in one go, making successive applications. So uh, you don't really need much ingenuity for coming up with the worst practices. The good practices uh, are to be able to see a lot of times what happens is that uh, the delays occur in spite of this frivolous because the council, when he appears first, is not ready to oppose. He is not, he comes to the court thinking only that it's for this application I'll file a reply. But 
if on the basis of the record which is already existing there is no need to file a reply and you are familiar with the facts or you have read the file the evening before then according to me there is no need the delay will not take place uh, so the lawyer and plus uh, of course to be always in the know of the judgments which uh, permit the discretion or the decision in one way so these i would club largely as the good and the bad practices thank you Mr. Chatra has gone off air. <laughs> yes, sir. Neither you would like to say anything on this. No, brother. I think it's fairly covered the issue, and you hit the issue on its head with a nail. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chatra, I was moderating on your behalf. <laughs> Thank you. It is a, one of the rarest privilege uh, <laughs> that one could have. <laughs> Uh, yeah. So, if a revision petition is uh, uh, pending against an interim order in a civil suit, uh, is pending in a uh, civil suit, and before that the civil suit gets decided against the revision, revision, whether such interim orders can be challenged in a regular appeal before the court of district judge. If not, then whether the revision petition can be pressed on the ground that the appeal is a continuation of the suit. Therefore, the same should be decided. What is your take on that? Uh, just a second, Rajiv. So I would just say that in this, uh, in our case, I kindly do not mute yourself. Then we have to unmute every yeah, time. Yeah, the, the, the practice we follow in Delhi is to transfer the revision petition to the same court where the appeal is pending, so that both can be decided together, or to dispose of the revision petition with liberty to urge that ground in appeal, and. Uh, uh, to if uh, there is a need for amendment of the appeal, then to grant leave for amending the appeal to take up that ground, and also clarifying that the disposal. per se need that one but i make a mention of it because it can't survive for an independent adjudication it perishes uh, they will have a right to do that one so the as you said that you had an experience of three high courts i would say that once we came on this platform we said that we will have the insights from three judges from two different high courts and myself from punjab and i yes indeed that's a different but but once you are there we can say that we will have the insights of four courts no with more courts with more exposure either you get knowledge or you get confused maybe i'm the less <laughs> so they say that the lawyers can too many cooks spoil the broth but the judges will always give the better insights they have the much deeper knowledge uh, so though it's a, of the negotiable instrument act but yes i found, found that this question is somewhat uh, can be used in the other aspects also it says in a negotiable uh, in a negotiable instrument act matter where the complainant is deaf and dumb can the wife of the complainant give evidence on behalf of him under section 120 of the evidence does the word against has any importance against in such proceedings in the first place is it 120 or 126 Could you kindly check and tell me? It's 120. He's written. I can just check it. All right. I can do that. Because if I have understood it correctly, the question is in a complaint arising out of 138 NI Act, the yes, trial sir. the trial is going on. can the wife of the complainant be a competent witness right no he says that uh, the husband is somehow deaf and dumb can the wife of the complainant give evidence on his behalf just like a power attorney what is your take on that i reckon when it comes to deaf and dumb there is a provision that uh, an interpreter an interlocutor could be appointed who can read the signal signs and then uh, assist the court so substituting by a fresh witness amounts to the witness by the uh, the wife becomes a witness 
and she wouldn't be supplanting or substituting. Suppose somebody is deaf and dumb, there'll be an expert with sign language. He can as well understand, put the question through the sign language, get the answers, and then explain that to the court. That's how the uh, shortcoming or disability has overcome. Thank you, sir. Uh, Justice Bakru, uh, would you like to give your certain insights on this aspect? Well, if you look at the Evidence Act, they, uh, you have a specific provision like has been pointed out by Justice uh, Naidu, I think Section 121, by a special order of a court, can be compelled to, uh, I think it's uh, Section 120, says that uh, parties to a civil suit and their wives are husbands, husbands or a wife of a person under criminal trial. In, in all civil proceedings, parties to the suit and husband or wife to any suit shall be a competent witness. In criminal proceedings against any person, the husband or the wife of such person, respectively, shall be a competent witness. Now, in one in, in a 138 case, if there is if there is a check bouncing case brought against a person, then there should be no, no issue uh, for the wife to step into the box as far as uh, the accused is concerned. But here it seemed to be that if the your question was if the complainant is uh, deaf and dumb, for that so one, there, for that there is provisions made that uh, you can have you can have an expert who will then. So one one nine would also help it. One one nine of the Evidence Act. Yes, one one nine of the dumb witnesses. That's right. That's exactly what just just said. There's a yes, specific sir. provision. I think yes, that's one one nine. For the participant, I can read that. Uh, 119 of the Indian Evidence Act, a witness who is unable to speak may give his evidence in any other manner in which he can make it int intelligible as by writing or by the signs, but such signs must be written and the signs made in the open court, evidence so that given shall be deemed to be as a oral evidence. Yes, indeed. Yes. And if I can add one sentence, yes. you see, when it comes to the wife being a competent witness in a case involving the husband and vice versa, you know, it all began with the concept under common law that wife and husband in the eye of law are one and the same, like Adhanadi Swara Tattva in Hindu mythology. That's why one cannot speak for the other. Even before English courts could, courts could take the lead, it's Indian Evidence Act which took the lead and said with this provision that they're competent. Later, English law followed that. Yes. So you're giving insights of the Succession Act. Uh, clearly shows that when you were teaching in the judicial academies on the Hindu Succession Act, why yes. people were just latching upon because we have gone beyond, uh, as we say, it's a beyond law that we are having the insights beyond what we have contemplated. Yes. So this a particular questions, uh, the both Justice uh, Enlosh and Justice Bakur would say, child assess guidelines approved in, uh, have been approved in Bombay High Court, Himachal High Court and Madhya Pradesh High Court. However, no such standardized guidelines have been issued in the Delhi High Court. Are, uh, is it likely to be taken up or what is that? It's your choice, sir, it's whether it has to be answered. No, I, I won't have any idea about it. I don't know if Justice uh, Bakro has yeah, had an occasion. We don't, have a, we don't have these guidelines as yet. Right, I'm sir. not really aware whether they are they're in the process of being... Uh, no, no, I, I also understand that once we are limiting to a particular... Siri Nivas, uh, Mudgil. Sir, can courts extend the limitation period by giving the procedure, uh, uh, by using the phrase procedure is a handmaid of justice or not? I think that's... Uh, uh, the, the Limitation Act itself provides a procedure for extending the limitation except uh, where that power has been taken away. So definitely, but uh, for instance, in a suit, because the law does not permit it, you can't use the phrase and uh, uh, condone the delay in institution of the suit. Similarly, under the Arbitration Act, Section 34, you cannot uh, use that phrase and extend the time for filing. So, strictly speaking, no, it doesn't apply to the Limitation Act. Very true. Uh, you see, there is another aspect. Your question yes. is much wide. It, it, it's much wider. It's not necessarily in a suit or in, uh, uh, in in an arbitral proceedings. Limitation is prescribed under several proceedings. You could have a uh, proceeding under the Excise Act, under the Income Tax Act, the civil. So the principle that I think this is 
and you just said that you have to look for a bar if there is a bar then you cannot if there is no bar then obviously uh, it can be expanded so i, I will it all depends on what 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 the procedure what the language of the legislation is i reckon yes brother i reckon in the context of uh, procedural law limitation act presents a very peak in position and for the beneficiary it is procedural for the affected party it is substantive law this is one oddity of a limitation act and the second thing is if there is an extendable limitation it is discretionary once there is a cap it is substantive that's why court cannot exercise say 226 or whatever to extend and go beyond the statutory limitation it's a bar mm. so point well taken but uh, i would just like to add like we had this interim order of uh, this of the honorable supreme court during this covid 19 that was extraordinary powers extended under article 142 wherein they said that the arbitration or the statutory where there could not be any condonation of delay that was according to me the only exception what i could gather where it has been extended beyond where it could not have been extended uh, uh, extended the limitation maybe extraordinary times call for extraordinary remedies not yes, always sir. though yes sir. no and this situation is equivalent to the court being closed See, the limitation act also provides for the limitation stopping to run if it is physically impossible to file so when it is physically impossible to find that power has been exercised within the ambit of the limitation act except for every in every case that application coming the supreme court has decided for every case which the, they are entitled to under the constitution so this is to curtail the litigation in every case an application for condonation of delay rather than that the supreme court has said it is condoned uh so uh, mr puneet malhotra dealing with the sufficient cause in condonation of delay and the limitation act and any other specific law so you have uh, no it says you have referred uh, so many questions are just pouring in yes anuj bansal you have referred to a provision of cpc where all interim orders can be challenged in an appeal could there be facilitation on that Sir, uh, Puneet Malhotra says. What is, what is the question? Sir, uh, Puneet Malhotra says dealing with the sufficient cause in condonation of delay under Limitation Act. Yes. And any other specific law? Puneet, I will unmute you because at least I have not been able to gather your uh, a question. It says dealing with the sufficient cause in condonation of delay under Limitation Act and any other specific law. So it's neither a question nor an answer. I am unmuting him. Uh, meanwhile, we will take a question of Kumar Ra Raj. Why the su summons don't serve upon the servant, but if home for servant, is, uh, if the servant is available at the home, then uh, why that service on the servant cannot be effected? You are directing it to anyone. <laughs> Uh, uh, it's an open-ended. Anybody can uh, open open-ended. Yes, Mr. Snyder, you oh. have the three quarts experience, so I think you are best with it. <laughs> may may I have the advantage <laughs> of having that question repeated, brother? <laughs> so the question is that let's assume there is a servant at home. Yes. Uh, can it be said that the service is affected because, uh, as we all know, that under Order Five it says the adult member in the home. I can. You know, earlier. Before amendment, I believe in 1976, it was any adult male member of the family. Then there was reeking of sexism, so it was changed into any adult member of the family. Male has been removed. Now the question is whether a maid or a servant becomes a domestic help, if you want to be politically correct, amounts to uh, a member of the family and the service. Well, it depends. Essentially. Whether which end of the stick you hold, if you want to be really liberal, you may as well say that yes, part of the household establishment is out, but family may not include adult member of the family, right? Family may not include. Left to myself, I don't think it is proper service because service is an essential feature of body alterum partum of notice. So it needs a little bit of stricter inter interpretation. We can stretch it not to the point of snapping. 
Yes, sir, in terms of what? And uh, I can even not be the service. Uh, uh, yes, sir. See, if we see rule 9, it says uh, it includes the word agent also. So, if there is a household in which there is <coughs> no member of the family available during the daytime or the time when the servers uh, ordinarily visit, then whosoever is at home, even if uh, it is because uh, you consider it from that point of view that all mail, why is uh, only the summons? All communications coming by post or by courier are received in that household through that person. So he would come within the definition of agent and uh, the court, if not, none appears in spite of the report showing that there is a service at that address proceeds against the defendant <clears throat> or the plaintiff, there would be nothing wrong in that procedure. Of course, if the party comes later on and shows uh, that all right, all this was received, but for X, Y, Z reason, that person did not deliver the summons to the defendant, then there may be a case depending upon the facts. Otherwise, uh, the moment there is a report it is served, uh, the court is to presume delivery. Uh, Very uh, true. If we could treat the maid servant or whoever as the agent, an employee, it does apply. Uh, so this is a, uh, one of the relevant questions which was posted on the WhatsApp. I can read it. Uh, rather, I would like to have the insights from all the three judges. How should the oral arguments be structured in today's day and age? With large number of matters on the judge's daily board and the attendant pressure, how should this vary in terms of the nature of a case, say a petition challenging an award as opposed to addressing a final argument in a suit? What do the judge looks at at this stage? Keeping in with the uh, heavy topics. Justice and law. So should, uh, I repeat, uh, should I repeat the question or it's fine? No, it's all right. Uh, see, I think it again uh, uh, is likely to vary from judge to judge. For instance, with me, I always uh, lay a lot of emphasis on verbal hearing, and ideally, I would not uh, opt for written arguments except. Uh, if in a particular case I feel the need and which is only in those cases which is a new field or a new subject which uh, I may not be very conversant with. Otherwise what one understands because let's see the verbal hearing is always interactive. So if uh, something is not clear to the judge or if some argument is not appealing to the judge, the judge can always put his doubt and get a Elicit an answer and which does not happen in the case of uh, written arguments. Now, as far as the present times are concerned, <clears throat> uh, we are uh, doing the hearings like we are uh, doing this uh, session just now, and uh, it is fully serving the purpose. It's not as if it's uh, any different. Rather, we feel that the council are also conscious and uh, they are confining themselves only to what is relevant. And see what happens in an open court when you are standing in front of 20 onlookers. There is a certain amount of flamboyance in the council. When you are sitting alone in your <laughs> office and you are arguing to a camera, so you tend to confine yourself to whatever is that flamboyance goes. Thus, I think there is something on our feet we argue more. Seated on the chair, we argue less. <laughs> uh, what are the insights of uh, uh, Justice Bakru on this point? That, uh, how, how to go I, about? I, 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 have, I have always been a firm advocate of, uh, of oral hearings being over 18. Uh, all over the world, written briefs are submitted by parties. They are, uh, if, you, if you get a written brief from anyone, for example, in the US, you'll see the quality is is, uh, is, is Amazing because you have all the case law that you want to rely on. It's precisely put. Uh, people don't. The lawyers there rely on their pre-submission, pre-oral submission briefs more than anything else. Oral submissions in uh, in uh, as far as uh, civil cases are concerned are 
actually almost like witness action. So while witness is there, your oral submissions are made there. They are very, very, very brief, and they are dovetailed with the evidence which is being laid. They rely heavily on uh, pre-hearing briefs. If you look at European courts, in um, for example, if you look at Hungary, for the matter, the Supreme Court there doesn't hold oral hearings at all. It only accepts written briefs, and if you find that there is some area where a higher debate is warranted, then those on a specific application are put for oral hearings. Oral hearings, vis-a-vis -a, -vis a pre hearing brief. I would, I would, I would, if a system has to evolve, I would say, let's give the written word a little more, a little more precedence and maybe take a, take somewhat of a mixed, uh, mixed uh, approach. I, 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 I would, I tend to prefer a, a, a written, a written brief more than oral hearings and precisely for that reading oral hearings, actually, if, if you look at it, it's very easy to get digress from the point and go all over the place. If you have a guideline of your written, written submissions or written briefs in hand, I think it's more precise. Uh, Justice Naidu, though, we had the, we were quite privileged that at least on this platform, we had one of your sessions on uh, arts of advocacy, uh, advocacy tools in this thing. So I will repeat the question for your good self. What is the role, no, I'm uh, taking a new question, what is the role of precedence in today's time? Is it more of an enabler and a guarantee of stability? As many see it, it, it to be, or with the massive growth of number of judgments, does it rep re represent a stifling influence and inhibit creativity in the arguments? Uh, how can it be used more effectively by advocates to advance their cases, so also to aid the judges for the better dispensation of justice? Yeah, if I put it in the light of being, the longer the question, the shorter the answers must be. <laughs> anyway, yes, precedent, it's our darling and it's our devil, both. And in common law countries, there's no escape. And peculiarity of, say, India is, we sit in panels, not N Bank, as, for example, US Supreme Court does. So, Uniformity is very difficult, be it a high court or the Supreme Court. If there are 16 benches, means technically speaking, we have got 16 Supreme Courts. Sometimes it's humanly quite natural that you may have diametrically opposite judgments because highly subject to law as it is on the same day. So yes, it has been a stabilizing factor. Sometimes it becomes a stifling factor, not in the light of being again, don't get offended. If not for the counsel citing, for the judge who has to interpret all these things bring some what sort of a uniformity, a thread running through that one and saying that they have not been conflicting and coming and trying to find the ratio. I've been telling in my class on the last occasion that we have not been sure what's meant by a precedent and we are not at sure, I have not yet arrived at an agreed meaning when it comes to what's the ratio. Is it the ratio that binds? If at all, then the ratio means a pure question of law or it's an application of facts to law. Then they become case holding. All these things are there. Yes, it's a very prudent device, a potent device. It all depends on how the council could marshal uh, the principle that have been called out from the president and apply to the facts of his case. It's more of his skill, whether it is stifling or enabling. Yes. I, I would request just uh, so I also to give you the insights, what is the role of precedence in today's time, and even otherwise, not only restrict to today's time. No, Justice Naidu has summed it up very well. I don't think, see, the question is based on the understanding, misunderstanding of what is a precedent. As Justice Naidu has said, if we understand what is a precedent, then this question doesn't arise. Because uh, we have, what is happening today is we are matching the color of the facts of one case with the color of the facts of another. That is not what the precedent is. The precedent is the ratio doesn't deny and not every judgment in which an earlier judgment is mentioned. It is the basic judgment in which the pros and cons of a particular argument have been discussed and then with reason it has been stated why this is the principle of law. Only that constitutes a precedent that if we Follow that strictly, then uh, this confusion doesn't happen. Uh, Justice Bakru, would you like to pitch in your 
expressions on this? So I, I think this is the, this question has been answered more than uh, more than sufficiently. So, so it is more uh, like a situation I, where there's a division bench or a full bench where they say it's <laughs> I agree. <laughs> uh, so that is true. What, what is the difference between process of law and procedure established by law? Just. May a simple uh, word, may, may, I, may I give a simple word of answer for that one? Lago maki, L O G O M A C H Y. Lago maki means playing with the words. <laughs> uh, I thought it's a Hindi word. Lago maki, but piche mat lago. Lago means word. Machination means manipulation. Lago maki. Yes, please. Uh, so we will just because we are six uh, touching six thirty. The what are the common bad law practices which have crept in as a result of the CPC now permitting an affidavit to be filed in lieu of examination of chief? The worst thing is that I have seen affidavits by way of examination in chief, which have arguments, which have judgments annexed to them, and uh, it just doesn't make any sense. And then there is cross examination on all that. So it's, uh, it adds to the delay, but uh, uh, since uh, uh, the provision is there and we are unable to give time for having examination in chief and court, uh, we have to uh, go ahead with this provision. <laughs> Justice Bakro would like to give his insights on this. Yeah, that is one of the, uh, the, the missing problem with the affidavits keep running into pages and pages and pages. Uh, and uh, I, by the time the person who's examining the witnesses and comes to the end of it, you, you, you wasted a lot of time. That's one of the problems of having an having uh, evidence examination in chief by way of an affidavit. In fact, Mr. Chatras, if I may add, what has happened is that the affidavits are no longer being drafted by lawyers. The affidavits are being drafted by the stenographer in the office who stole it converted into a <laughs> affidavit. So the plaint or the written statement is converted into an affidavit, just changing the third person to first person. There are paragraphs about court fees. There are paragraphs about territorial jurisdiction when there are no issues on that. <laughs> if I can add. Yes, sir. I believe a procedure as such is value neutral. Uh, it's neither good nor bad. It's like a knife. The whole question is who holds it? Is it the surgeon or the butcher? <laughs> it all depends on that one. Mm. And when it comes to chief examination, if you read any book on art of advocacy, they say that the most difficult part for a counsel is art of advocacy is chief examination. You know what happens even for a client, usually the court atmosphere is oppressive and quite intimidatory. So once he gets into the box, bumps himself up, facing his own client, another counsel, and then he eases out. He'll be comfortable by the time cross-examination comes. Now that isn't there, straight away he's put into the box and the cross-examination, the hostility begins, firing straight away, first thing. Second thing, most of the times, either the counsel, as my brother has put it, or the clerk would be drafting it. And the party is clueless about what's been there in it. Based on that, there could be cross-examination. He frizzles out. These are the practical difficulties, but when it comes to time saving, it's there and it will remain there. Yes. Uh, uh, thank you, sir. But I'm just uh, reminded that they say sometimes, as uh, Justice Sai uh, said, that large number of times it's cut paste. It's actually so happening that, yes, drafting could be by a senior counsel. Then at the part of, not a designated senior, but at the or an associate that you simply sit uh, converted into a examination in chief uh, in that manner. Yes, it has its own perils, but as things go. So now it's 6.30. Uh, we can take more questions, but I think that we should go by the sh schedule. But before we part, as uh, we had made a request, we would just like, since Justice Naidu had already taken one of the sessions on art of advocacy and skills, uh, I would just requ request Justice Sahai that if he could give his insights as a good lawyer, 
how what he should draft at the first instance what are the so that there is no procedural lapse or what he, insights he should do how he should go about the research etc so that at least the drafting gets better the the, the the client does not lose at least on the aspects of that certain issues are not there or he is not the client is not left to argue through his counsel that either the pleadings or the evidence should be read in terms of that order 7 of the cpc or that the savior just acting like a god that any other order or direction could help him to save through hey what is happening is that uh, with the with so much emphasis on moot courts the profession of law has come to be recognized as uh, having a skill in speaking is that uh, the art of listening has died down from the profession so the major problem today in the pleadings is that the counsels themselves realize what their case is at the time of final arguments you will find it in umpteen number of cases because what is happening is that when a client comes to the uh, uh, counsel the counsel doesn't listen to his problem he thinks the moment he says the first few words he thinks i know the rest and he stops listening he doesn't ask any question because you see the client will come and tell you only what he feels is relevant to that case the client will not tell you what he doesn't feel is relevant but with the study of law the lawyer knows that besides what he is saying there is a b c factor also which are relevant now unless the lawyer puts questions to him and probes to the client the lawyer will never know so the first practice to be adopted is to be a careful listener and to ask the questions uh, after knowledge of law seeing which provision applies studying that provision what are the ingredients what are the basic minimum requirements without which you cannot succeed or you cannot have a possible defense so it has to be a full study at that time and not merely see a lawyer is not merely a drafts person what is happening is whatever the client tells that is put in the legal language and it is drafted there is no addition of facts on the own so that's why when the a written statement comes or the replication comes and those facts are there then you ask your client that is it so then the client says yes and then the you will tell the client that why did you not tell so he'll say you did not ask me that so a complete knowledge of facts of the case all the facts not only what the client tells but what you inquire from him a full knowledge of the law applicable to the case is very important and one practice i can share what i followed in the suits which i knew are going to have a long trial and which were very complex and because you know there is a complete draft so if you feel that you may forget why you have written a particular thing or why you have intentionally not written a particular thing i used to in those cases prepare an ad memoir and put it on top of the file so that everything was the entire strategy of the case from the stage of drafting to the stage of final arguments was there so i think if these two things are uh, followed there is no reason why there should be procedure of course has to be known you uh, yeah see i just now said that the emphasis is too much on substantive law but procedure i would say is a given a uh, once a law degree is there a person is supposed to know the procedure because procedure is taught very well and there is nothing further to learn in the procedure than what is taught in the law colleges it's just honing up the skills so listening is my biggest uh request to everyone thank you uh, just as bakru would you like to uh well i add? i think all has been said but one just one thing i would like to add you know uh, at least when we joined the profession it was very common uh, for us to check with forms and presidents if you look at forms and presidents there is there are several uh, publications have it uh, you have uh, you have a frame for a suit which is actually put in such a precise uh, format that if you get 
you have a suit and if you get a right form for it you will you will probably cover all aspects and yeah. apart from that form the president also gives you some of the leading uh, decisions on the issues uh, for example if you are doing a bank guarantee injunction uh, if you wanted an injunction suit for bank guarantee form the i know but what's form the president that exactly a suit for it told, that told you precisely that your only ground would be fraud and uh, vitiating the underlying contract and so on and so forth so that because that the practice of looking at least form the president when you frame a suit may just help lawyers in drafting a better suit before asking uh, just as naidu to give his insights i am probably recollecting because we have had so many webinars and i probably have the idea that probably just as naidu said that when the client comes the mind also works like a google that you have read more of the issues then instead of listening more to the client then the mind goes on the google as to what judgment or what precedents would help him to sail through rather than noticing sometimes the fact the the lawyer in an anxiety to show demonstrate that he is actually knows the subject he will try to demonstrate that there is one judgment probably sir you had spoken on that day while you were speaking on art of advocacy for the facilitation of the participants who have joined today or who have not watched our youtube channel i would like that uh, what are your takes on this particular aspect yes first as you said i have already covered this issue second in this full bench decision already two judges concurred i could not dissent so i concur with my two brother judges the third one <laughs> if you would like to add some spice to the whole issue let me put it this way and there is one uh, law professor called betty sue flower betty sue flower any young advocate can google betty sue flower macj she gives a particular method called macj to draft any pleadings effectively that means m stands for madman a stands for architect c stands for carpenter and j stands for judge and it's a wonderful exposition anybody can read or brian a garner in his books in more than one book of his he has explained the concept on how to draft this is one thing the second thing totally unrelated to our field is one book written by atul gabande he is a surgeon that book's name is checklist manifesto please young lawyers go through that you will have valuable inputs in that one if you still feel and curious to hone your skills of drafting please read a book called point made by ross guberman and also keith evans pleading without tears i think they will take you to a very finer aspect of having your skills improved thank you uh, uh, sir i would just add the number of books you have said the majority of the lawyers would say that since you have the entire cracks and you have just funneled it down uh, let there be a time where we can have another insights no. from yourself because faithfully <laughs> last time too i sent a list of the books that i referred to this time too i'll just message to you so i have that uh, i have that list of 21 books which you had uh, referred in your last session of Ed art of advocacy i will post that uh, books yes uh, but i am quite sacrosanct that the way you read the books by the time the last on the last occasion two weeks ago when you had came on this platform you had cited 21 books of the cuff you could say this book for this particular purpose i am quite sacrosanct that by, if i asked you maybe three four books more have been would have been added it would have been a quarter but with like humility just, with humility let me tell you i am incapable of doing anything else yes. no I, i just wish that everybody could have that like just as uh, i was saying that pe uh, the lawyers are not just not willing to listen i am reminded that often we receive a message just and lost uh, we receive a message that silent and listen are two words having the same spellings but it is only the placement what matters if you listen properly at a particular stage and you are silent at a particular stage i think that becomes a more better hallmark for a lawyer to do i will just ask just as in law uh, if the point which my lords have been trying to have her if that point at least i have could have been conveyed to the participants that silent and li listen are two int integral parts to become a good lawyer so what is your take on this particular aspect yeah i think it's uh, very uh, uh, appropriate for cross examination because a lot of time uh, one says that the own case is destroyed by excessive cross examination and more particularly so in the case of wills 
that uh, the, even if the will has not been proved by the propounder, the objector by excessive cross-examination proves the will. So, uh, knowing when to be silent is a very, very important thing. And uh, at times, not so, so often, one sees that happening in the during the uh, hearings also that by uttering something which was uncalled for, the cases are destroyed. Sir, uh, the time is uh, about to over. I'm just reminded the way you said that the art of examination and cross examination is important. I thought that we were talking through a very topic which is quite. Sometimes, as a young lawyer or any other lawyer, it looks very good to listen. I'm just reminded of the examination and how the lawyer can be done. A just parting uh, joke, I'm reminded. It is said that a person was involved in a tough case and he was bound to be convicted. So his lawyer told that whenever any question is to be asked from you in the cross-examination, you just say, Purr. So by the end of the evidence, uh, whenever the questions were asked, he said, whenever he was to be asked, he said, Purr, and he was declared that he, he's not... Uh, sane, he, he, yeah, he's insane and he was acquitted. So ultimately, the lawyer says that you see, I've got you acquitted. Kindly release my balance fees. He then says, "Poor." So sometimes the too much of tutoring also goes other way around. So it was a nice session. We have got great insights. It was an experience of its own kind. That th the three judges coming and like we said, that uh, Justice Naidu. We will not say three. We have. Three judges, but insights from four courts. That makes the entire session uh, much, much, much engaging. It was a session which everybody, I feel, who have been the participant here as well as on the Facebook, would actually cherish this entire session. Uh, thank you, sir. But before we part, this is Joy Kantawala to express a vote of thanks. And tomorrow, instead of the normal routine of the session, which we are taking at five o'clock. Tomorrow, we have a session by Justice Ram Kumar, a former judge of the Kerala High Court. Uh, <coughs> I will just read the topic before Sajoy takes over. Or, or Sajoy, you can uh, formally say, then I, I will just tell the topic for tomorrow. Yes, Sajoy. Lordships, uh, it has been a very enchanting Sunday evening. And uh, we all woke up from our naps to join this session. Thank you very much for spending your valuable time. Procedure is a handmaid of justice and that now we have got it ingrained in our minds. But what just, uh, Lord Denning said was that once the right uh, to a certain fact or an exemption is available, or is available then you all you have to do is to iron out the creases. So that is one more thing that he said and therefore sometimes Uh, say, is it audible? No, it's gone offline. Uh, so probably he uh, he got too much. Uh, this thing that one should also remain silent. I will take a cue from where uh, Kanta was was saying. So it was a session which we all enjoyed. The inputs received today would be. I am quite sure that will be embedded in the minds of everyone. For not only for today, but for all times to come. During the lockdown time, we could not have got a better session where the memories will be locked with the inputs and insights given by your good self, all three of you, would be cherished as a good food during this session and for all times to come, food of knowledge. Th uh, thank you, everyone. And tomorrow's session by uh, Justice Ram Kumar is Fundamentals of Criminal Trial. He's a former judge of the Kerala High Court and he has been teaching in various judicial academies. Stay connected with us. We will be posting in the various groups as well as on the Facebook. Uh, tomorrow it's 11 a.m. So on behalf of Beyond Law CLC and ULS Punjab University Chandigarh, I thank all three of you. And amongst us, uh, we had Justice uh, Moshmi Bhattacharya. Uh, I will just check as to whether she's there. One, one few... In this is Moshmi. We are unmuting everyone if she's on the platform. Uh, uh, Ma'am, you are uh, unmuted. Uh, uh, 
because I had received a message that, uh, meanwhile, uh, Sujoy Kantawala has written. Hi. Thank you, everyone. Uh, on behalf of Beyond Law CLC and everyone, thank you. Stay blessed, stay healthy, and enjoy the best of the knowledges during all these sessions till we actually work for in the normal course of day. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>